Thanks for being here. After a long day of awesome talks, you're still here, and I love each and every one of you. This is great. So, yes, sorry, no guitar today. Guitars and airplanes are not best friends. Um, and also, when I started actually building this presentation, all of the six slides that I'm going to show to you, I was like, I, I was reading up, what did I hand in again uh, month a month ago to the lovely organizers of this conference? And would it in any way match what I'm going to talk about today? So if you read the blurb on the website, it says, Holger has done this and this, Holger has done this, it's all true. Yes, I have led managers through innovation processes, but then again, everybody did, probably. I also made managers draw penises. That's also true, and I'm going to tell you why in a second. So I figured what I would love to tell you will last around eight hours. So we're going to skip that. But I am going to show you three things. And if you only take home from me these three things, or one of these things, I'm already happy. So I want to talk about process design. And I drew a process there for you. It's not the typical process I would put all my trust in, but it is a process. The true answer would be a much more boring image, of course. I want to talk about process design, um, and I'm so happy, at least today, I'm not the only one. Uh, if you've seen it, Sasha earlier today gave a brilliant talk about processes as well. Brilliant, love it. Usually at conferences like this, or let's say in the, in the broader discourse, people usually talk about the what. What framework, what, what do we need to build, stuff like that. Now in the last few years it changed towards the why. Hey, we need to have a, just like we learned this moment, we need to have a mission, we need to have a purpose in what we actually do. Nobody's talking about the how. And that's what I'm here for. I want to talk about the how. How do you actually go about things? How do you actually do stuff? And how can you, being probably, I assume, most of you the change agents who bring change to organizations, how can you give tools to other people so they know the how as well? And I want to start with two small examples, one very tiny and one very large, huge. The tiny one. I was working with a brilliant designer. We were planning a workshop. We were doing ideation. We, with the team, I have one uh, case study I'm alluding to every once in a while. It's, unfortunately, it's all under NDA, as are all the best case studies. But I will tell you a few things here and there of it. And by the way, last week, I was talking to one of the people in the team that I'm working with right now. I was like, hey, next week I'm in, I'm in Lisbon. I'm going to talk about a little bit about what we're doing right now. And I handed in and I, I got approved with a sentence, I made managers draw penises. And he was like, managers, really? You called us managers? <laughs> <laughs> so sorry about that. We were planning in, in uh, an ideation workshop. We did all the research already. Now it's time to generate ideas from the vast of research. So she was a brilliant designer and then she prepared something, the rules of creativity. And, and I'm like, okay, show me that. I know uh, we, we're doing this project in German. Germans love the rules, as you may have experienced already. But then again, come on, the rules of creativity, you see a slight mismatch in there. So we talked about it. One of the rules was uh, don't judge ideas on a first whim. You need to, if others bring up an idea, you need to think about it before you dismiss it outright. That's true. But then again, if you structure the process in the right way, there's not even a chance people might do that. If you structure a workshop in a way, okay, first we all gather ideas, everybody by themselves, then we present ideas to each other, and then we discuss them. There's a higher chance ideas might not be rejected outright. 
without needing rules. One of the other ones was uh, you need to build on ideas that others brought to the table. Great idea. Again, rules and creativity, I, I don't know, I didn't like it. But then again, if you structure the process the right way, if you say, okay, everybody presents their idea, then you put them all on the wall. You've all done this a hundred times, at least. And then, before even discussing it, everybody look at the wall and create new ideas based on what you see there already. If you make this mandatory, if you structure your workshop this way, immediately people will build on each other's ideas without you needing rules. The second example is much, much bigger. I was working at a large corporation. They were uh, setting up a new team. They were hiring for this new team. Did not have the best hand in hiring, so that's why I definitely won't mention the name. And they had a certain setup in mind, which turned out was not the best setup you could take for such a new initiative. So, what happened was, everybody for themselves, total chaos, yada, 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 and then somebody had this bright idea, well, of course we're getting nowhere, of course we're infighting, because we don't know where we should go. We need to have a big workshop and come up with a purpose. Great idea. So we did that. We had a, a mission and a vision and some values, and you know these, and I'm deliberately giving you a bad example right now. The, the mission was something like, uh, we'll build the future of X, and the, the, the vision was, we'll be the center of excellence for X, stuff like that. You, you know the drill. Turns out, the week after this workshop, nothing changed. Of course, we had the big mission, vision, and, and some, some values for good measure, but how does this translate to your day-to-day -day work? I've talked to so many people in different companies. Okay, the mission is we'll be the center of excellent for X, but my, my uh, PowerPoint file is due by Thursday. How does that fit together? You need a way to translate these. And the answer is the same as the smaller earlier story. Uh, set up processes in a way that people know what they can do and should do. So three things I want to show you. Number one, and by the way, I try to avoid fancy slides. This is the fanciest slide I already have. And I already had this last year, but it bears repeating with a different framing. When I talk to companies, to managers, to C-level, I start drawing this diagram. I first draw only the X and Y axis, speed and maturity. And I tell them, hey, just so you know, without even looking, but I'm guessing you're probably somewhere in the bottom left corner. Sorry about that, but you're probably down here. You need to be quicker and you need to be more mature in what you do, faster and know what you're doing. That way you can be agile. And the standard answer is always, oh, we already do agile, thanks. And I'm like, no, no, you need to be agile. Yeah, yeah, we're doing scrum. And I'm like, no. You're not getting it. And they're like, yeah, we think we're done here. And I say, no, you need to be agile, like quick on your feet. You have, need to have the speed, but still know what you're doing. You need to know even more so what you're doing when you try to ramp up the speed. So what I'm saying is, by the way, you're in the bottom left corner, what I call the swooning repose. Nothing changes and nobody cares. If you go to a team or to a company or wherever, to an organization and say, hey, do what you're doing, keep doing this, but be quicker, ramp up the speed. What's happening? Of course, chaos. That's a recipe for chaos, don't do this. Also, if you go to a team uh, and say, hey, keep doing what you're doing, but you need to be more mature in what you're doing. You need to really know what you're actually doing here. That's a recipe for standstill. That's when they do three months of user research, 12 months of customer studies before committing to anything. Don't do this either. What you want to do is ramp up the speed, 
while ramping up the maturity, this quick on your feet and knowing what you're doing, so you get to what I call conscious velocity. This is not velocity at all costs. This is conscious velocity. You're going as fast as you can go. And if you didn't guess it already, these green lines are like the, the left and right on the autobahn, uh, your, your guardrails. Don't fall into the chaos, don't fall into the standstill. Why should you be doing this in the first place? Why, even if you're at the swooning repose, as I said, nothing changes and nobody cares. So if nobody cares, why should you change it in the first place? Why should you have conscious velocity? Several reasons, and there's one I'm going to focus today. Um, one, one possible reason is you can lower the stakes, basically. If you look at a large corporation, how does anything get done? You write a proposal uh, that gets to your, your boss. He or she will only approve this proposal if she knows how much will this cost me, how long will it take, how much will I get out of it, when's it due, and you already take away the outcome. That's not a good way to work. If you go to your boss and say, hey, I don't want this big approval from this big initiative. All I want is a week or a day so I can try something, a little experiment. And if it takes us somewhere, great, we'll continue this. Then we can maybe spend a week. Then maybe we can spend two weeks. If not, fine, we tried something. If you lower the stakes, then you can get to conscious velocity. And that's basically an, ex an excuse to ramp up the maturity. If you try something and learn from it, and then try something more and learn from that, that's how you get to maturity while ramping up the speed. What I'm trying to say is, you can't go faster than you can learn. Make a photo of this, frame it, put it on your toilet. And if you do, send me a picture. <laughs> you can't go faster than you can learn. And the reverse means, if you want to go faster, you need to work on your learning. If you, the speed to be faster, and tell me any manager who wouldn't love you to be much faster with whatever you're doing, the key to be, to be faster is to be better at learning and to, to be faster at learning then you know what you're doing. If you want to do this, the easiest way is to treat your work, whatever you're doing, or, or your team, or whatever, as a product. Or treat your processes, or whatever, how you go about it, as a product. As soon as you do that, you know what to do. With any given product, we build, measure, learn. We learn from customers, we see what works, what doesn't, what can we improve, what do we need to uh, cut out. As soon as you treat your own work, your team, your department, your process as a product, you know what to do, basically. Yeah? You can't go faster than you can learn, that means work on your learning. Institutionalize that. The second thing I want to talk about. I said the key to this is processes. These are the five typical building blocks of processes. If you want to design a process, an innovation process, a design process, a management process, whatever process, you need goals, matter, process, decision, team. You need goals, what do we actually want to achieve? The matter at hand, what do we actually want to create? The process, how will we go about it? You know when, where, and why to make decisions. And you know what kind of team you need to do this. So far, so good. Turns out that's only half of the story. That's why it's only half of the slide. There are, each of these five factors has a modifier. And that's the key where we get to the, how do you make process fail safe? If you know a goal you want to achieve, or goals you want to achieve, you should know 
What are the requirements? How will I know that I actually have achieved my goal? If you don't know these, ask your stakeholders, ask your team, ask yourself, go on a meditation retreat and come back with requirements. How will I know that I have achieved my goal? There are different types of goals. You all know, um, I, I found it most helpful, there are three types of goals. Procedural goals, you know the output you want to create and you know how you will go about it. That's easy, you can just write down the steps you need to take and do them and be done with it. In the middle is tame goals. You know the outcome you want to achieve. You're not exactly, no, sorry, you, you know the output you want to achieve, but you're not exactly sure how to do it. That's still something you can work with. On the other end of the scale, wicked goals. You all know wicked problems. Consider that basically the same thing. You know the outcome you want to achieve. You have no idea how you would go about it. That's usually where the fun is. I've heard earlier today uh, this distinction, outcome and output, right? Output, you know what you need to create. Outcome, you know the scenario you want to end up in, in the end. Usually that's the more helpful definition of a goal. You probably all have seen or experienced people who are like, yeah, we can skip the research, only to know we're gonna do a voice-driven app. And you're like, why? Because I said so, okay, yes, but why? Because it's the new hot thing, everybody's doing voice-driven apps. Okay, voice on a smartphone, not integrated with Siri, probably not the brightest idea on the planet. If you talk about it in terms of outcome, I want my customers to experience my services without needing hands or in situations where you cannot look at smartphone screens or whatever. Then you can immediately gather even more ideas how to go about it, which may be a voice-driven app, may not. So if you know requirements, either quantitative or qualitative or just expectations that others might have. This is usually what strategic designers call the dark matter. If you do this initiative, your, your stakeholders might say, um, we want this and this outcome, here's how we will gonna measure it. But what they don't tell you at first is, and by the way, I expect you to not ruffle any feathers in my company, something like this. This is dark expectations, ask them point blank, hey, what else do, should I need to know? What else do you expect from this? If you know this, that's how you can structure your process. Put the goal on top, put the requirements below, and make it a, a, like, like a graph, like an inverted tree, if you will. Because the trick is, all these requirements are actually steps you need to take on your way to reaching your goal. I've seen so many initiatives Okay, this is our goal. We know we need to hit, I don't know, some bogus number, like 10,000 new customers, fine. Then they build something and then they hope in the end it's good enough so that they will reach 10,000 customers. Don't wait till the end. Don't hope that you will reach your requirements. Hope is usually a bad strategy. Build this into the process itself. If the requirement is customers will want to buy your product, you may want to incorporate this into the process. You may want to ask customers, hey, is this a product you would want to buy? Usually they say yes and then they still don't do it. So another requirement is, hey, I need to know how to ask customers so let they give me an answer that's actually usable for me. Stuff like that. This one example I'm, I did recently, um, we took managers who had no prior experience whatsoever and we built uh, new products, web services, as digital prototypes in two days. They've never opened Sketch or Figma or anything. In two days, we did it. Of course, it took a bit more than two days, 
because one of the requirements was the customers, it has to be cool for customers. That was their definition. It has to be cool for customers. And I was like, okay, cool can mean anything. How about it has to solve their problem so that they may want to buy it? Okay, already defined a requirement. We need to figure out their problem so that we can then solve it. Okay, a step before, okay, we need to ask customers. Okay, one step before, one requirement to this is we need to reach customers. We need to find where are they actually and, and make appointments maybe or, or know where, where to, to contact them. Step before this, these were people brand new to doing any of this kind of work. Okay, if we interview customers, maybe we should know how to freaking interview, you know? Not everybody is a pro at doing interviews. Maybe they need to learn this first. Maybe um, a set of questions, like, like an interview guideline helps. So we needed to gather, okay, what questions do we actually need to ask? But this was a whole new field, nobody worked in it. So we needed to do some desk research before even that. So, okay, what's the industry in general saying? Where's, where's the trends going? So that we know what questions to ask, so that we, that, no, we know what questions to put into the questionnaire, with which we then could train how to do an interview, so that then we could do interviews, so that then we could do create products, so that then we knew these will probably be something that customers might be interested in. This is getting clearer, right? Put all your requirements as a step on the way towards the goal and treat them as a milestone, maybe, if you will. Matter the thing that you are creating or the thing that you are working on and form. Usually, people have a hard time doing both at the same time. And you see this all the time. People are building something and while building it, they're like, okay, how should I... In what form should I put it? God forbid people building PowerPoint presentations. And while they're designing, they're thinking about, okay, what actually do I want to say in my presentation? Don't, never do both at the same time. Do one and then the other. Doesn't matter the order. For example, at this project, uh, we made them build paper prototypes. Just sketch interfaces on paper which also they've never done before. So we dictated the form so that they could concentrate on the matter. We dictated, okay, everything has to be one use case. Imagine you have this new product, you love it and you want to show it to your best friend and show them why this is the coolest thing in the world. What's the one feature you would show to your best friend? Put it in five screens. We dictated this a little, not four, not six, five screens. Every screen has a logo in the top left corner. This is how we want to draw a navigation if we need one. This is how we want to draw buttons. This is yada, yada, yada. In these colors, we dictated the colors so that they could concentrate on the matter and not, not get creative or, or think they would have to be creative with a form. In the end, we had paper prototypes that all looked somewhat similar, which is cool, because then they were comparable. And they could do it on, on the first try. Nice. If you ask songwriters, sometimes they have the matter in the form of the lyrics and have to bring it into form, in the form of uh, music to it. So you can dictate one or the other, it's fine. Just Never do both at the same time. Process, how do you then actually go about it? And what mindset do you need from the people you're working with and also from yourself at each step along the way? When do you need to be open for things, for other ideas, for other opinions? When do you need to be focused? Okay, the discourse is fine, but we need to get something done. For example, with these paper prototypes, we told them in advance, don't go crazy, don't draw something fancy because we will do friendly user tests, you will interview your colleagues who are nice to you, and after each, you will throw your paper prototype away and redraw it. 
We told them up front, whatever you draw today, you will draw at least 10 times more. That put them in the right mindset. I don't need to be, this doesn't have to stand the test of time. I just need to scribble down something. And everything, everybody else also only scribbled down something. That was cool for them. Decision, when do you make a decision? What does it take to make a decision? Same with the requirements. If you know, for example, at one point we had to present to C-level, to board of directors. How do you know that they will like it? A, they were very nervous. B, their strategy in the past was, let's try to make the best presentation we can and hope it all goes for the best. No. If you already know management has to approve it, yeah, you build this into the process. You give a box of chocolate to the assistant of the C-level board member and say, by the way, in return, can you put me on his or her calendar for 15 minutes? Coffee would be nice. And let's have a chat. By the way, next week we're going to present this, this, and this. Any thoughts? Any feedback? Any input? That's how you get to fail-safe uh, C-level presentations. And also iteration. Know when you're going to iterate. Maybe know this even up front. If you build something, maybe decide early on. Whatever we build now is one possible way. Before we even do any decisions, let's commit to we do five iterations. Before we even make a decision. And lastly, team. Yeah, what kind of team do you need in order to do this? and facilitation, how can you go about it. So for each step, you have your goal, you have your requirements. These are steps along the way towards reaching the goal. Each requirement is a goal in and of, of itself, which also has, if you will, sub-requirements. That's how you map out a process. And for each step, okay, what's the matter in the form, what's the process in the mindset, decision iteration, team and facilitation. Yeah? If you do this, you will get to a good result. If not, you designed the process wrong. If the, if the requirement is that the result should be good, then you plan this in from the outset. Look at design sprints. You know, design sprints, Jake Knapp from Google Ventures, five five-day process. It's like a black box. You put some idea Monday morning into the process and Friday evening you have a prototype and feedback from customers. In, the, in between, it's a very detailed step-by-step -step process. That's why design sprints are so popular. Everybody can do this. And this is good. This is a good thing. The only, the only way a design sprint could still fail if your hypothesis up front was wrong. If you start a design sprint with I'm pretty sure we need a voice-driven app for whatever thing your company actually works on. That's a recipe for failure. That's clear? One is nodding, enough for me. <laughs> I said this last time already, a goal will inspire you, but a process will empower you. If you have a goal, cool. That's nice. It's always better to work towards something. If you have a process, or if you know how to create processes, then you can do anything. That's cool. Hey, I like that. I sometimes teach design at university in Berlin. I always tell my students, the best thing you can do is invest in a design process. That's like your secret tool belt. Huh? The third thing, how do you map out processes? There's two ways I brought, and there's probably even more ways. One is, uh, has to do with horizons, a.k.a. time. The other with altitudes, a.k.a. scale. How do you map out a process over time? You have your project, and then you have maybe months, and then 
each month has a few weeks. This is not drawn to scale. And each week has a certain number of days. Or if the project is longer than a few months, maybe you have a layer in between years already. If you map out the whole project in advance, just as I described, you can do this and you should do this, but only on a very superficial level. Okay, we know in the end we need to build a product. In order to do this, we need to come up with a good product idea. In order to do this, like the double diamond from back to front, maybe it helps if we come up with more than just one product idea so we can uh, pick the best parts and, and get something really going. And before this, maybe we need to do some research. Okay, imagine this is a project going for three months. Okay, one month research, one, one month ideation, and then one month validation and, and starting to, to build the actual damn thing. On a superficial level, that's fine. Don't start planning a project. Okay, in the second month, third week, fourth day, we are going to do this exactly. That's when you set yourself up for failure. Instead, go by levels of horizons. If you want to look to the far end, and that's where the metaphor is from, to the far end, to the end of the project, well, you can see rough shapes depending on your vision, but if you look at the next day, you see things very clearly. Use this to your advantage. This means when I do something like this, I map out a whole project. Always in the middle of a month, I plan the next month. Always in the middle of a week, I plan the next week. And usually after a day of work, I plan the next day. Because only then, only the day before an actual day, you know enough to really plan a day. This is also a very lazy way to, to incorporate any changes. If you, if you say, okay, in the end, we'll be probably somewhere there. We know roughly what we're going to do each month. For each month, very roughly each week, and even worse, each day. What exactly we're going to do each week, we'll know the week before. What exactly we're going to do each day, we know the day before. That gives you freedom to incorporate any new developments, changes in plans or whatever, and still pretend this was always the plan all along, you know? So that's mapping out a project over time with different horizons. If you map out a project over scale, that's levels of altitude. Imagine you're in an airplane and you're looking down. No, you don't see all the details, but that's fine. In return, you're 9,000 feet in the sky. How cool is that? If you're <laughs> down on the ground, then you see all the details, but in return, you have a harder time seeing the bigger picture. And here are three levels, person, team, organization, there's probably more or less depending on where exactly you're trying to do this. If you are C-level or work with C-level and you want to reshape a whole organization, that's fine. But don't expect C-level to plan what each individual person is going to do. You may want to distribute this to teams and let the teams figure out the details and then let each person figure out the details. That's like a if you want to do this top-down. If you take C-level management and say, okay, today we're talking about Brad Schneider, what's his day-to-day -day task? Do this five times and they'll kick you out of the room, of course. They're like, okay, these are, these are adults, we hired them, they're smart, otherwise they wouldn't work here. Let them figure out the details. The return is true as well. I, when I speak at conferences, I sometimes hear afterwards, okay, that's fine if you have the mandate. That's fine if you are C-level. What can I do in my department, for example? Well, you can start the other way around. Okay, how do I work? And then going from there, 
maybe how can we do this with the whole team? The best way I've experienced somebody uh, getting influence, like how do, how do they say it, power from behind, if you will, or, or leading from behind. Next time there was a big meeting, she tried with her boss, hey, by the way, this next meeting, if it's fine with you, allow me to moderate it. Allow me to structure this meeting. I'll, I'll promise we'll do everything you want, but allow me to structure it. The boss was like, how cool is that? <laughs> no work for me. So she did, and everybody was like, this is the best meeting we ever had. Can we always do meetings like this? And she was like, yes, fine with me. And by the way, after five meetings, I'll teach you how to do this. And by the way, next time we start a new project, we'll do it this way, not just a meeting, but a whole initiative. That would be like the bottom-up approach. What you want to do is replace confusion with process and anxiety with trust. Boah, what a loaded sentence. <laughs> what I mean by that, if you look at the field of psychology, if people should be doing something but they don't, it's usually fear. If people, look at organizations, if people should change their ways or their, their departments or their whatever they're working on, but they don't, it's usually fear. In organizations, the answer is simple. You're working with people who for 10, 20, 30, 40 years learned one way to make a career in this organization. All of a sudden, you're telling them, okay, now forget everything after 40 years of making career this one way, and now do another way. Of course, they're skeptical. Every empirical evidence they have tells them otherwise. If you look at procrastination, in psychology, you know, people who should be doing something, but they don't. And the bigger the task, the, the more they want to do the task, the more they're inclined to actually not do it. If you need to wash up your dishes, you don't do it because, come on, it's washing up the dishes. You can do this anytime. If you need to write the big report that's due in two weeks and you always wanted to write this big report and you still don't do it, that's procrastination and the answer is fear. And there's always two things people are afraid of. A, they don't know where to start. They don't know how to go about it. And the second, they're afraid the results might not be good enough. We are creatures of habit. If we don't know how to go about it, or if we think, let's, I don't know, maybe I would know how to go about it, but I'm afraid the results are not good enough anyways, our natural response is to just not do anything at all. That's procrastination. All of a sudden, the dishes should have been cleaned up all the while. All of a sudden, we, we really clean our dishes when we should be writing the big report. It's always these two things. You don't know how to go about it, and you're afraid the results might not be good enough. So this confusion, where should I start? Replace this with process. And that's what I mean. This, this framework, you can teach other people. I teach this at departments I work with, and I make them structure the whole project. And all of a sudden, they can work on anything. They, at, at least they know how to structure anything. Then they have process. Whatever they do now, most of the time, not always, of course, but they know how to go about it, so there's less confusion. That's step one. This anxiety, what if the results are not good enough? Well, if you know how to structure a process, you know you can incorporate this into your process. If you are afraid the results are not good enough, plan for that. Plan, okay, we, do not one, we don't have just one shot, because then you really need to hit your target. We have 10 shots. One of them is probably a winner. Or we don't build a prototype once, we build it 10 times. 
We iterate 10 times and it will get better through this. And then you can replace anxiety with trust. And the beauty is you can trust your people or the managers you work with can trust their employees. Colleagues can trust each other. And the best part is people can trust themselves. And if you make people trust themselves, that's probably one of the most powerful things you can do. And I thank you for listening. So, I don't know, do we have time for questions? Yes? We have 10 minutes. We have 10 minutes? Mm -hmm. Great. I tried to keep it short and I kept it even shorter. Uh, before you know, before uh, we take questions, just so you know, I'm here all day tomorrow as well. If you see me, just come up, say hi. Even if I stand in some weird corner, I'd love to talk about this. Also, this is my email address if you have questions. This is me on Twitter. I would love to be a friend on Twitter also LinkedIn or wherever else you hang, hang out. Um, this whole idea, I, I joked earlier this would take eight hours. Uh, an even better metric would be this, to describe all this, would take around 100 pages, single-spaced. <laughs> and I know this because I am writing this down actually right now, which is the best way to ensure you are gonna fail is announce it publicly. <laughs> um, so sometime next year, more end of the year, not so much beginning of the year, there may be a book coming out. And if you're interested, write me or let's hook up on any of these networks. Now for the questions. Hi, I'm Anna. Thank you so much for your presentation. I really liked your approach, like uh, more hands on and uh, the, um, the trust, I think it's the main issue because we, perhaps we are talking about design and we want to be innovation things, but at the end, if people don't trust themselves, no one will move it forward. So my Thank question you. here, uh, is uh, in your talk we talk about you talk about horizons and uh, the way you plan can you give me a little bit more detail about uh, how you plan because you you said something like don't plan anything everything like uh, have the the big goal at the end and then step uh, go uh, and then from the beginning basically work backwards yeah so um for example, what I, what I mentioned earlier. Okay, in the end, we want to build products that customers love. So one requirement is already in the goal, that customers love. So how can we make sure that customers will love it in the end? Maybe we should involve customers earlier so we have an earlier handle on will they love it or not. Um, and work our ways backwards from there. Okay, so we need to talk to them. In order to that, we need to plan interviews. In order to that, we need to create a questionnaire. In order to, net to that, maybe some desk research. That's how we structured the whole project. And that's how we came up with, okay, phase one research, phase two ideation, phase three validation, and planning the whole thing. Month to month, we split it up into, okay, roughly this week this, that week that. Week to week, it was much clearer. Okay, usually in the middle of a week. Okay, next week, we have Monday to Friday. Not everybody was always in the room. Uh, some people had vacations, some people worked elsewhere. Okay, who's here when? What can we do each day? And then day to day, the evening before, um, usually I had one colleague prepare this a little bit in advance, but we went through it the night before okay, how do we structure the day? This was really, in the beginning at least, very meticulous. Okay, 8.30, everybody arrives, gets coffee. 9 o'clock, we start with an introduction. 9.15, we introduce the topic for the day. Stuff like that. After a few weeks, we 
got the idea and didn't do it that detailed. But that's the level we planned it the night before, usually. Sometimes we even, um, when I said, uh, how do you structure a process, even smaller, I said we did some desk research with these people to get a grip on the, the target audience, the target industry we're, we're working for or trying to work for. So we said, let's, let's gather hypotheses. Post-its on a wall, uh, one side was, I think that, dot, 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 complete that sentence. The other one was, I wonder if, dot, dot, dot. Gather hypotheses, what do we think about the industry we're working for, or what did we always want to figure out about the industry we're working for? Then we made pairs of two, and okay, each pair grab one of these hypotheses, you get one hour, after an hour you present the results. But we told them how to structure this hour, because we knew otherwise they might be lost, at least the first time. We, we gave them the structure, and also um, that was, if you will, the matter, but we dictated the form. We said, okay, if it's an hour, you have half an hour that you spend on Google, on, they had an internal database full of industry studies, white papers, whatever you can find, half an hour. Then 50 minutes, exchange this with your colleague, figure out the highlights you both gathered, and then 50 minutes, bring this into form, and we gave each a, a flip chart poster, like a big white sheet of paper from each of you teams of two. Uh, we want one poster that you then present to each other. So nobody had to do elaborate PowerPoints or something, nobody had to write up a report. Also, nobody was fumbling on their, on their laptop with a projector. I wanted to show you this cool website, which then takes hours, which you don't want. No, everybody, a poster, present this. The added bonus, we did this at the very beginning of the project, we put all the posters on the wall, which made for a very nice image. And every morning they came to the office was a nice reminder of, hey, we can do this. We, we, we got this. Does this help? Cool. Any more questions or comments? Here we go. Um, so, a lot of what you've been talking about is for um, project-oriented work. How would you take these ideas and apply them to um, work that is not project-oriented, that, that, that is ongoing, evolutionary systems, um, services that don't come to an end? Do you see a, a mapping between your ideas for projects to more open-ended types of engagements? Yes, and that's one of the reasons I don't really like the term process design because then people in their head immediately are at like manufacturing processes or uh, this is probably more closer to what Sasha talked about earlier, like processes within the company. The, the one trick that I would use, and so far this helped me all the time, is to treat this like a meta process. Okay, we want to change our, let's say, manufacturing process how would we go about changing or optimizing our manufacturing process, and then this will help you. Or like customer complaint comes in, and then we have to deal with this within our company from support to like, I don't know, claims or whatever. Uh, my invoice is wrong. You bastards. And, and how can you optimize these processes? As usual, treat the work as a product, so these let's say customer care processes, measure what works, what doesn't, optimize that. But this act of let's optimize our customer care processes is like a meta process and that's where this would come in handy. Which then would make it a sort of project. So you're right. <laughs> If not, you know where to find him. Go grab him uh, for more, for more follow-up. And let's end with a big round of applause. Thank you very much.